respond to things, especially our children and our communities. And we really can set the tone for a lot of things. Let us panic, but set the tone for peace. Because we worship the Savior, but it's all about peace. A peace that surpasses all understanding. Today we're going to jump back into Hebrews chapter 3. And look at verses 17, 7 through 19. If you want to turn your Bibles there now, and I'll just remind us of where we're at. We looked at Hebrews chapter 2, and how the writer of Hebrews was talking about this gospel message being declared by angels and being proclaimed by Jesus Christ. And that this message is a message that can be trusted. Last week we looked how the writer of Hebrews compared Jesus to Moses. He said, Moses is great. The law is great. But Jesus is the greatest. Jesus fulfills the law and Moses pointed towards fulfillment of the law, a law that had to be fulfilled. When God said, don't or else, he has to follow through with the or else. When he said, surely if you eat of this, you will surely die. And it became so. But Jesus himself fulfills what we could not. But the writer here in our spoken scripture today is going to give voice to the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is speaking to all of us. He's going to personalize the message that the Holy Spirit gives to the individual. It's as if the Holy Spirit is saying to you, so the writer goes on and uh, verse 7, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, therefore, is that adverb that connects what the writer's about to say with what he's already said. So in light of this, and in light of the message that was declared by angels and proclaimed by Jesus Christ, the gospel message, a message that can be trusted, therefore, in light of this, or because all of this, the Holy Spirit says, and what follows is a quotation from Psalm 95. And what the writer of Hebrews is going to do is he's going to quote Psalm 95 and then be like a good preacher. He's going to expose it. He's going to break that down for us. So he quotes Psalm 95. He says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion breaks it down. He says, now on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years, therefore I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they know they shall not enter my rest. The rebellion, he refers back to, hey, remember Remember your heritage. Remember your ancestors. Remember the escape from Egypt and Exodus. Remember those uh, Hebrews that rebelled. That despite all the miracles, despite all that they were seeing, they still didn't believe. They still didn't obey. Remember that. These people constantly rebelled against God. This is exactly what God is showing them, but also us today. We are unable to enter into God's rest in his presence in this state, in this rebellious, disobedient state. We cannot enter his rest. The Holy Spirit said to them and is saying to us, you cannot be in my presence, in my presence the way you are right now. You can't be unchanged and be in my presence. You don't have to live this way. That's the good news. You don't have to stay in your current state. The writer goes on and says, take care of others. Lest there be any of you and any be in any of you an unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. Heart in this sense is more like the will. The writer here is using it in this sense, what we would consider the will. There's a volition, an act, an intention behind this. 
So we could actually translate it by taking heart right out of there. We could say, take care of brothers, lest there be evil men among you. Those who are intending to do the opposite of what God says. Those that are doing the uh, opposite of what leads to eternal life. He says, take care, lest there be any evil men among you. For those that have evil intentions or evil wills. Contrary to popular songs and wishful thinking, people are not generally good. People are generally sinful. And it takes a considerable amount of energy to combat the natural inclination of the heart. If you're a parent, you know this. I did not have to teach my child to be selfish. But boy, it takes a lot of energy to make them not selfish. I didn't have to teach my child to be ungrateful. But man, it's taken a lot of energy to uh, convey to them how important a grateful heart is. Now they'll show some of these tendencies natural, but it takes a considerable amount of outside effort to make sure that they don't fall into themselves. We know this. And since the fall of man, our hearts have been attempting to lead us from God, not to Him. Without some type of outside intervention from God Himself, we are left to our own devices, which is not a good state to be in. The writer of Hebrews is not naive to think that everyone reading this letter is a believer. He's writing to the church, but he knows not everybody in the church is actually a believer. He knows not everybody in the church has great intentions. And you can meet all you want. You can be under the same roof, but we're not naive to think that everybody is going to obey and believe. Judas himself controlled the money bag. Judas himself was a close follower of what Christ taught. So he warns us. He says, be careful of those evil men and those evil ideas that ultimately pull us from the salvation God provides. And he says this, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original com uh, confidence firm to the end, as it is said. Uh, quoting again, he says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Today is not tomorrow. Today is not yesterday. Today is the present time. And I want you to think about this. When can you make a change? you change yesterday? Try. Can you change tomorrow? If I worry just a little bit more, if I toss and turn just a little bit more, if I'm a little bit more anxious, possibly tomorrow will change, right? Wrong. The only time we can make a change is today. That's it. Right now. The writer saying, today, the present time. Why the urgency? Why the urgency in this? Well, so that none of us may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The writer takes us back to the comparison of the Hebrew people out of Egypt. Their path from captivity. And he says this, For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest? But to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. The Israelites, in their rebellion, despite all the evidence in front of them. Despite the pillar of fire, despite the pillar of smoke, despite the parting of the Red Sea, despite the manna from heaven, all of this still in rebellion. And God says, you can't enter my rest in that state. 
Does this still happen today? Yes. See, the more we are in sin, the harder our hearts become. We grow actually comfortable to sin and with our own sin. In fact, sin can become so normalized in a society that when you speak out against it, it's as if you're the one that appears unloving. It begin, uh, becomes such a part of our culture and our normal that when you speak out against it, you're the crazy one. You're the unloving one. I want to give you an example, a, a real example from my life. When I was growing up, there used to be a kid that would ride his bike in the street. And it became very common that cars would slam on their brakes and they'd walk at this kid. Get out of the road. We lived in town, so traffic was relatively slow, 25 miles an hour. Plus. It was the same thing almost daily, especially in the summertime when school wasn't in session. This kid would ride his bike across the street. You'd hear a horn honk. You'd hear some shouting, get out of the road. And the just going and riding a bike across the road. The mom got so sick and tired of yelling at his kid that when the horn started honking, she would literally wake up or look up from her gardening or whatever she was doing outside. And she'd hold her hands up to the driver like, what's your problem? This is a community. Kid riding her bike across the street. You need to slow down. You need to watch where you're going. This happened all summer long and the next summer as well. Nothing ever happened. The car would slow down or slam on its brakes, honk the horn, the mom would do the same thing. This went on for a while until they moved into the country. Where the cars didn't slow down. Where there was no expectation of a child crossing the road. And he was killed. He was hit by a car wasn't expecting a child to be crossing a road in the country where they go 55 miles an hour. It ended his life, destroyed his mom's life, and wrecked the driver's life. Because they became so comfortable with sin. And God says, when I said something, I mean it. When I say that you can't enter into my rest, you're going to be shocked one day when you try to enter into my rest and I go, hold on. You can't be here in that current state. And society today will be offended. It'll be offended because, how oh, dare you say that to me? I can be here. I have a right to be here. Don't you know this? And it'll be as it's written. Lest you change, you cannot enter into his rest. The more we get away with sin, or the more we are immersed in sin as individuals and as a society, the more comfortable we become with it. The harder our hearts become. And it really is a slow process. It has to be. If it's too fast or too shocking, you might realize just how sinful it is and change your ways on the spot. Let me ask you, does sin still bother you today? When somebody misrepresents God's created order, like I read an article the other day, uh, a man dressing up in women's clothing and reading uh, children's stories uh, to kids. Is that funny? Or is it heartbreaking? Does it bother you more when somebody uses the F word as an adjective or Jesus' name in vain as a curse word? Can you look at your neighbor with compassion because they were made in the image of God or does seeing them swell you with anger because of what they did to you or what they didn't do to you? Somebody is violated, whether it's on TV or in your very presence. Are you sad for the victim? 
I'm just kind of glad it didn't happen to you and your family. We all have to examine our own hearts against what the Bible teaches. We have to examine our hearts against our own circumstances. And sometimes we're going to examine it and say, yes, yeah, sometimes I'm okay with sin. And that concerns us. I'm okay with this sin and I'm repulsed by this sin. Perhaps I'm okay with this sin because it's become so normalized in my life. The sign our hearts have grown hard. But should you find that your heart maybe have grown hard in certain areas, I have good news. It's still today. It's perfect. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity just to examine our own hearts. Father, we lift all this up to you, our hearts and our whole being to the one that can change us. We pray for a change in our own lives and our own hearts in our communities and the world that all may come to know you like they've never known you before. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.